At the same token, I find a problem with someone manufacturing lies and fabrications and dramatizations and mythologies with Jesus Christ, especially when Jesus Christ himself had nothing to do with the evidence that they use. Now let's keep it on point because that's the issue. There's no tug of war here. There's no issue here of arguing, trying to uh, cast aspersion upon Jesus or Christianity. Because Jesus, for us, was a Muslim. Because Muslim means one that submits to God. Because Abraham was a Muslim, because he submitted to God. And Moses was a Muslim. And David and Solomon were Muslims. And all the prophets of God were Muslims because Muslims doesn't mean Arabs. It means those that submit themselves to the law, the legislation, the inspiration, and the revelation from Almighty God. So if Jesus is a Muslim, we on his side. Let's be upon you all. Uh, thank you all for the uh, time. Uh, yeah, so let me start the topic for now. <clears throat> so I chose the topic let's unlearn and relearn Islam right let's unlearn and relearn meaning whatever you are you taught you have learned or you've taught you've been taught from the so-called scholars or the sheikhs the shiuks or the imams try to unlearn them and relearn them so you have to try to unlearn and relearn whatever you have been taught salam uh Ru'in Azizi. Barawz billahi mina shaitan rajim. I seek refuge with Allah against the accursed devil. Waman ahsanu kawlan mimman da'a ila Allah wa amila salihan wa kala innani min al-Muslimin. And who is better in speech than one who invites to God and act righteous and says, Indeed, I am of the submitters. Hazi sabili adu ila Allah ala basiratin ana wa mani tabani wa suba'ana Allah wa ma ana min al-Mushrikin. Today's topic, we are going to talk about uh how to unlearn and relearn islam right i played a video by yasir uh sorry by khalid yasin right khalid yasin i played a video just what he spoke about concerning how uh jesus being a muslim and the prophets being muslims now the word muslim right it is not an english word it is an arabic word the word muslim However, people have romanized it to make it sound English. It's not English. It is an Arabic word, right? The equivalent to that word in English is what we call submitter. When you submit yourself to God, you are called a submitter. So when we bring the equivalence of that word in Arabic, then we say what? A Muslim. Huh? Muslim. Because you have what? Done what we call Aslam. So when you submit to God, you are a Muslim. So by definition, all the prophets of God were Muslims. That is the simple instance here. However, when we are telling a present day Christian or Jew or an atheist or anybody you have, you are telling such a person that, oh, Jesus was a Muslim. To them, they don't phantom that because when they picture those Muslims they are seeing today, they see a Sunni, they see a Shia, they see Ahmadiyya, they see Qadiriya, Sufiya, whatever have you, Salafiya, Wahhabiya. When you tell them Jesus was a Muslim, they picture those people and they're like, no, 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 no. He can't be those Muslims. I don't define such Muslims as Muslims. They are mushriks because they associate partners with God. To them, legislation only doesn't deal with God in the deen. It has to be associated to other scholars and other shuyuks and imams. That is what they define as Islam. So that's why when you meet a Sunni, he will call himself a Sunni Muslim. You meet a Shiite. A Shia will call himself a Shia Muslim. You meet an Ahmad, uh, Ahmadiyya person, he would call himself Ahmadi Muslim. You understand? So they associate things with the Islam God has given us. So in order, in order for you to understand Islam in the proper way, you have to unlearn things you have been taught in the past whilst you are a kid, because a lot of the things you have been taught, you pick them up whilst you were a kid. At the age when your reasoning wasn't up to par, so you pick them up at that time when you were what? 
nearly an ignorant person. You were only enforced and mentally enslaved to take such, uh, you know, you know, believe, and you accepted. So we call that indoctrination. So for people who don't know about that, you can watch my previous lecture I did. It's called indoctrination, right? Good. Now, what you need to understand, you and I need to understand is certain things you have been taught. And because you have been doing it for a long time doesn't necessarily mean it's right. So just because of the longevity, uh, the longevity of something has existed doesn't mean that thing is being done right. Let's say you go to somebody's house. He's been cooking with a particular oil or, or salt, uh, certain ingredients, which is very, very harmful to people's health, right? But because these people is, this person is unaware, he kept using it, he kept on using it. But since he hasn't seen the effect, the side effect yet, he might not know this is dangerous. So when you encounter this person for the first time and you ask him which ingredient do you use, then he end up telling you, oh, I've been using this thing in my food. You caution him and be like, excuse me, that thing is dangerous. If he want to act ignorant, he will say, come on, who are you to tell me this is bad? I've been eating it for so many years. You are now coming within one minute to tell me this thing is dangerous for my health. Then he will tell you, how come I never died? Do you see the, the part how ignorance works? So certain things you have been taught i won't say you have been taught because when you have been taught something it means you have to use your critical thinking ability to ask questions so that is why in a classroom you find that the intelligent students in the classroom are the ones to always ask the teacher a question because they want to actually break things down and understand them in a proper fashion right so you don't just blindly follow what you are being told just because it is a, a an imam or it is a scholar, or it is a teacher, or it is a prominent person speaking. It shouldn't, that's not how knowledge should work. So when you take Quran chapter 18 and you read from verse 65 up to verse 82, you will see that even though Moses, Prophet Musa, salam, he went to seek for knowledge, he kept questioning the teacher. Because just because you are my teacher doesn't mean whatever you say is final. I need to question you. I need to be sure of what you are teaching me. I need to critically use my senses to ask certain questions. I don't need to blind follow you. You'll be the dumbest person on earth to think that Islam is all about blind faith and you just have to believe what the scholars tell you. No, it doesn't work like that. Before you put your faith in something, you have to test it with knowledge. Then you can decide if you want to put faith or not. This is how faith works. Quran chapter 42 verse 52. It tells Prophet Muhammad, Ma kunta tadri ma kitab wala iman. You did not know what was the book nor the faith. You understand? He, didn't, he never knew in the past before God now what taught him. So in order for you to have faith, you need to understand what we call knowledge because you get it from a book. That is why every knowledge we are studying around us can be found in that the source comes from the book. We have to go to a book to verify because it's any piece of information that you know, that you can prove, that is knowledge. Because if I tell you I have the knowledge of fixing a mobile phone, I need to bring the, you need to bring me a mobile phone for me to fix for you to see it, which shows that I have the information and I know and I can prove it. So that is my, that is what we call knowledge, right? Now, so coming to that, <clears throat> you find out that what we have been told, a lot of things we have been told in Islam today has nothing to do with the real Islam. Quran chapter 49 verse 16, God is asking a question. He says, Are you the ones going to be teaching God your, your religion, your deen, your faith, your doctrine? Are you the one going to teach God? Whilst he knows whatever is in the heavens and the earth. So it is rather God who has to teach us Islam. It is not we in the other way around trying to formulate something we call Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, Ahmadiyya Islam, whatever, whatever Islam. It doesn't work that way. You understand? None of the prophets in the universe ever existed claim to be a Shia Muslim or a Sunni Muslim or Ahmadiyya Muslim. No, they are only submitting to God, the will of God. And that is what makes you a submitter to God. So when you are a submitter to God, automatically you are in a faithful religion called what? Islam, which in Arabic 
that is Islam. In English, it means submission because you are submitting to the one and only God who created the heavens and the earth. That is what classifies somebody as Islam. So if today you are born in a religion called Christianity, you, are, you can still be a Muslim whilst being a Christian because in the Christianity, you were born into it. You didn't choose it for yourself. You were born into it. You grew up as a kid. So you've been what? A, a, a mentally enslaved to a set, certain concept you never verified. So when you start verifying certain things, you start to check, chunk things away, making no sense. You throw them out of the garbage. Then people who don't understand you would think you have become an atheist or you know what we call a free thinker, which is not the case. Quran chapter 17 verse 36 says, وَلَا تَغَفُوا مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِيْئِلْ إِنَّ السَّمَعَ وَالْبَسَرَ وَالْفُعَادَ كُلُّ أُولَيْكَ كَيْنَ أَنْهُ مَسْئُولَ Quran chapter 17 verse 36 says, Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Indeed, the hearing, the eyesight, and the mind, all those will be accountable thereof, are responsible, and will be answerable thereof. Because God never gave you these faculties in vain. He gave you for a purpose, and you have to utilize it. So you don't just get up and say, oh, I found my father's doing something and I, I have faith that it is the right thing. Are you dumb? You have faith that it is the right thing? What if, what if the parents are wrong? Quran chapter 2 verse 170. What if your parents or your fathers did not understand anything nor were they guided? Have you ever asked such a question? You need to reason. Ask questions. Just because you've been doing the Salat five times doesn't necessarily mean it is right. Have you ever scrutinized to check the source of where it's coming from? Hello? I'm giving you the heads up. You reason. Question things before you participate in them. You don't just get up and follow things blindly just because you have been told or just because it's Baba Shraib speaking. No. You understand? You verify what Baba Shraib tells you. When it resonates with your brain, accept it. If it doesn't, put it aside. You understand? So just because some things have been told to you and your brain is not yet up to the task to handle it, doesn't necessarily mean it's a lie. But don't practice it yet till you have been convinced by it. So you have to scrutinize it yourself. Do you see the point here? Good. So let's move on with the lecture. So let's unlearn and relearn Islam. Now, when we go to Quran chapter 16, verse 89, God says, He's telling the Prophet that we have revealed to you the book as a clarification. When we say tibiyana, it can be an elucidation, it can be a clarification, it can be the, like, like what we call exposition, right? To expound something. So this exposition, and God used the word for all things, God didn't say except illa. To say accept uh, five salat, accept raka'at, accept tayyah, accept zakat, accept, he doesn't say that. He gave you a book which is a clarification for all things. Do you see the point? So you have a book which clarifies everything for you concerning Islam. Listen carefully. He didn't say he's clarifying everything concerning some garbage book some scholars have written for you or some invention somewhere else, or to tell you how to use a mobile phone, or to tell you how to use your laptop, or to tell you how to drive a car. That is not the purpose here. If you want to know how to drive a car, go to the company who created the car to show you how the car should be used. You want to know how to use a mobile phone, go to the same company who gave you that phone and take the manual and study the manual to know how to use that phone. You want to know how to drive an airplane to be a pilot? Go to the airline and then check what they have given you consent. Uh, so those on TikTok, kindly share, reshare, so that people, other people can benefit from this uh, awakening uh, lecture here. Now, <clears throat> yeah. So what we need to pay attention is, just because you grew up in something doesn't necessarily mean what you're doing is right. So pay attention. Quran chapter 16, verse 89, God is the one who has revealed to you the book as a clarification for all things concerning the deen. That is why at the end of the verse, it says, Lili Muslimi, for the submitters. So those who have submitted to God, they know that the book of God gives answers to all the things they need concerning what? Al-Islam. Not concerning Sunni Islam. Not concerning Shia Islam. 
<laughs> those are man-made dogmas and religions so beware right aha uh -huh. so when we take quran chapter 24 verse 18 similarly we see that it is god who is actually doing what clarifying the verses to us so let me see for those on uh facebook and youtube and i take you to quran chapter 24 you go to verse 18 this is what god says god says what you buy you know lahu ayat wallahu alimun hakim and God clarifies to you the verses. God is the one who clarifies to you the verses. Because the book belongs to God. So he is the one to clarify the book to you. But some ignorant people out there will be telling you, God brought the book, it's not clarified, so it is for the prophet to clarify the book. Are you telling me the prophet is smarter than God? Or are you just dumb? Won't you use your reason for once? Right? Quran chapter 24, verse 18. This is God speaking, the book of God. And God clarifies the verses to you. For God is what? Omniscient and wise. Because he has already given you a book as a clarification for all things. As simple as it is. Uh, let me see if I can share the screen. Yeah, greetings. Greetings, bro. Kofi, Kofi. Yeah. I share the screen. Let's see what the verse says. Quran chapter 24, verse 18, for those on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, yeah, salam, Zach. You're welcome. Uh -huh. So Quran chapter 24, verse 18. It says, wallahu alimun hakim. And God clarifies the verses to you. You understand? God is the one clarifying the verses. You will never ever see one verse in the Quran where it tells Prophet Muhammad that you should clarify the Quran to them. No. Quran chapter 75, verse 16 to 19. God told the Prophet, La bihi wa Quranahu, fa iza Quran. Thumma inna alayna bayanahu. Thumma inna alayna bayanahu god didn't say thumma inna alayka bayanahu god never asked the prophet to do the clarification of the quran you'll be the dumbest fool ever to believe in the indoctrinations you have been given outside the quran to think the prophet is the one to clarify the quran however this is what the mushriks will do they will quote quran chapter 16 verse 44 where it says, Wa ilayka zikra linnas ma ilayhim wala That verse has nothing to do with clarification of the Quran. God didn't say, Wa anzanna ilayka Quran linnas. He says, Wa anzanna ilayka zikra. Where will you find the zikr? Go to chapter 38, verse 1. God says, Swad wala Quran zi zikr. The Quran contains the azikr. So if God says, ilayka zikra It doesn't say, ilayka Quran You'll be a fool to interchange such words and put your own scholars' views there. So caution. Just because you have been taught something since you were a child doesn't necessarily mean it is right. You have to revisit it again and scrutinize what you have been told. Good. So let's continue. Now, when we go to Quran chapter 17, verse 12, God says, At the end of the verse, he says, And of everything we have explained in detail, or we have elaborated in detail. Of all things that God is talking about in the Quran, he gave you a detail of everything. Right? Now, however, when a sectarian is dealing with the Quran, somebody with an opposing view, and when you tell him there are every details in the Quran, he will say, okay, the Quran mentions Salat. Show me where it says two rakat. You are the dumbest fool ever. First of all, the word rakat is not mentioned in the Quran. God never gave you any concept of two rakats, three rakats in the Quran. So you, the Muslim, where did you get the concept of three, four, five rakat? Who gave you in the first place? So if it is not in the book of God, which God, other than Allah, ask you to do two, three, four rakats? Hello? You have to revisit what you have been taught. It is not your hadith books, which is the foundation of Islam. 
However, it is the book of God which determines what Islam is about. You see, so this is the chaotic misunderstandings people are inheriting in their lives and think they are actually practicing Islam. Same goes with Christianity. You go to Christians, there are a lot of concepts of things they do, you don't find it in their scriptures. And even if you find it in the scriptures, you find out that what they are actually doing in reality differs from what it is found in their books. Do you see the concept here? So you have to scrutinize what people are doing. That is why Quran chapter 2, verse 170 says, وَإِذَا كِيلَ لَهُمْ تَبِئُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ Then they say what? قَالُوا بَلَّتْ تَبِئُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا أَوَلَوْ كَيْنَ أَبَاءُهُمْ لَا يَاكِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَدُوا What if your fathers did not understand anything, nor were they guided? Have you ever asked yourself such a question? What if your leader, what if your scholar, what if your imam is ignorant? Have you ever scrutinized Put them to the test to check if they know what they are saying. What if the teacher teaching you is leading you astray and you are going to fail your exams? Have you ever scrutinized? Examine what your teacher is teaching you. Do you see the point here? What is you are being lied to? So on the day of judgment, Quran chapter 33 verse 67, people will lament on the day of judgment by telling God, Qalu Rabbana, inna atana sadatana wa kubara ana fadaluna sabila. Our Lord, indeed, we have obeyed our leaders, that is, our masters and our leaders, our elders, and they misled us from the way. You just obeyed. You never scrutinized. You never questioned. But here you are critically thinking against your, your, your politicians. You are reasoning what these politicians are telling you. You start to question. You are like, oh, these politicians are lying to us. Yes, because you have started to reason. So how come you can't use the same reasoning against your scholars of your deed? You see the point? Aha. Uh -huh. The same, you have to use the same reasoning against the scholars of your dean. If you don't use it, something is wrong in the brain. So you have to unlearn the things you have been taught whilst you are a kid and relearn them. Because whilst you are a kid, maybe you have been mentally enslaved. You are not given the chance to critically think as a kid. People are thinking that Islam, the Prophet Muhammad was the founder and, and bringer of Islam. No. Prophet Muhammad came to it, meet Islam. The word Islam is an Arabic word. It's not an English word. So when we say Islam, we are not talking about a, a new concept. It is the word in Arabic which people have romanized it into English and they keep saying Islam. It simply means submission. We submit to God. If you have faith, what you need to do is you submit to God. That is it. Look, we have people who have been working in companies hmm, for so many years, but they have never met the boss. So just because you, you did never met the boss doesn't mean the boss doesn't, that doesn't exist. Do you get my point? That is what we call faith. You can There is a, always a signal to let you understand that there is a boss of the company. But just because you don't see the boss with your eyes never meant, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It is because the boss exists, that's why the company keeps moving. Because obviously somebody has to set the company up for you to become a worker. So you see an atheist questioning you and say, okay, if you say there is a God, show me God. Are you dumb? Can you go to Donald Trump eh, office? Will you be allowed to enter? Can you just say, show me Trump? and just go to the office it doesn't work that way you understand uh -huh. so same as you have a boss in the company which sometimes you never see your boss but you are working because there are other people in charge supervisors and whatever have you this is an, an example and a metaphor i'm giving just because you don't see your boss doesn't mean he doesn't exist so just because you don't see the angels doesn't mean they don't as it exists do you get the point God mentioned that in Quran chapter 21, verse 35. Uh, he says, Kullu nafsi za'ikatil maut. Wa nabulukum bishar wa la khayru fitinat. He says, every soul will taste death. This is what God says. And this has been the concept since creation. All the souls we know keep dying. I will die, you will die. We keep dying till the day of judgment. Now, I wonder, if anybody can stop this thing, can stop people from dying. I'll believe, I'll believe, I'll stop believing in God. I'll take the faith away. 
it is impossible for people to stop dying. We will die, whether we like it or not. Do you understand? Good. So this keeps life moving because somebody has to go and somebody has to come. It's just like a company with workers. If no worker is resigning, if no worker is leaving, how can a new worker enter? Where is the space? A worker has to leave for another worker to be entered. Do you understand? Vacancy open because one worker has to retire. One worker has found a new job. He has to leave. One worker is sick. Do you see how it goes? So the God who created you for this space, small space you are called, earth, you are living on earth, you have to go and someone has to come. It's an assignment. You have to fulfill your role and go. Somebody has been given 50 years. Somebody has been given 100 years. Somebody has been given 20 years. Somebody has been given just two years. It is not your issue for you to complain. Just like the boss decides in the company you are working, so does God has to decide how we live on earth. It is not an injustice. You go to a workplace, you have supervisors, you have managing directors, there is secretary, there is organizer. You might be an ordinary worker in the same company. Is it unjust by your boss? The answer is no. It is a role given to all of us and we have to play accordingly. If one fails on his role, it can affect, affect the others. The same goes with our scholars. Just because the scholars are there teaching you doesn't mean whatever they say is final. They can make mistakes, they can lie, they can be corrupt. I hope you get my point. So good. Number one, Islam as a, as a deen, the word Islam is an Arabic word. It is not an English word. So if you are saying Islam, try to find the equivalence of Islam in English word. It means submission. Submission didn't start with Prophet Muhammad. He came and met it. The prophet who left, who stayed on earth and left and died and went, or were all submitted to what? To God. None of them were doing according to their will. But according to God. Right? Good. So when you submit to God, automatically you are what? A Muslim. That is the Arabic word. Submitter in English. So when we say Jesus is a Muslim, was a Muslim, it doesn't actually mean he is a Muslim as you are seeing the mushriks doing today. That is not the Muslim we intended. The Muslim we mean is he is submitting to God because Jesus is not the greatest. He has someone greater than him. The one who sent you is greater than you. That's why he's sending you. When you go to a work and your supervisor is giving you instructions because he's greater than you. It's simple logic. You, you get my point. Good. So Quran chapter 42 verse 13 verse to verse 14. He gave the same religion, the deen. He gave it to Noah. He gave it to Abraham. He gave it to Moses. He gave it to Jesus. He gave it to Muhammad. It is nothing different. The religion is about submission. You have to submit to God. If he gives you the command and you submit, that is it. Just like when you go to a workplace, there is the managing director, there is the supervisor, there is the secretary, there is the whatever have you. They are all submitting to the boss of the company. But it doesn't matter what role you each of you play. That is why some prophets, they are, pro they are kings. Other prophets are not kings. Some prophets come from a poor background. Other prophets come from a rich background. Some prophets are, have been given a lot of miracles. Other prophets were not given much miracles. Do you see how it works? So it doesn't necessarily mean that since this prophet is playing this role and that prophet is playing that role means they are not Muslims. They are also meeting to God. I hope you get my point. That is why when you see the birth of Jesus, he was born as a toddler and there's a miracle with him. There's a Holy Spirit supporting him. It's different. Way different from the way other prophets have been born. We saw the story of Musa alayhi salam in the Quran. He was born as a child, cast in the sea in order for the wife of Pharaoh to find him. We didn't see any Holy Spirit guiding him and making him speak. It doesn't happen the same way like that. But he's also a submitter to God. I hope you are getting the point. So bear in mind, Islam never started with Prophet Muhammad. You'll be a fool to think Islam, submitting to God, started with Prophet Muhammad. Right? It is only the fake prophet they depict in the Hadith, not the Quran, the fake one they depict in the Hadith books, which is the one which is fake, is modern, is new, but it never came to the, from the Prophet of God according to the Quran. So pay attention to that. Right? 
Good. So if you want to see how Abraham submitted to God, Quran chapter 2, verse 131, where God told him, Aslim, he told God, Aslam tu le rabbil alamin. I submit, I have submitted myself. That is, I have submitted to the Lord of the universe, the Lord of the worlds. That is what makes you a Muslim in Arabic. You understand? So it is not a new concept. Abraham submitted to the same God, right? And we see Moses in Quran chapter 10, verse 84. And Moses said, oh, my people, if you have believed in God, then rely on him. If you should be what? Submitted, Muslimin. So the word Muslim is not an English word, but an Arabic word. The equivalence is a what? Submitter. When you are a submitter, automatically in Arabic, we say Muslim. Then we go to Quran chapter 5, verse 111. The disciples of Jesus, they said, we have believed and testified that we are what? Submitters, Muslims, right? So it is not a new concept. They submit to the will of God. That is what makes you a Muslim. It is not a foreign thing to think that Islam, to say, oh, Islam has been there since the time of Abraham. Because the word Islam is an Arabic word. So you don't expect to find it in any other book because the Arabs were now given a prophet who has to bring a book in Arabic language. So that is why the word Islam now, we see it now, we don't see it in other history books because it, the other books came in different languages. But it's the equivalence of that word in different languages. So it's submission. For the, for the Christians who are watching me, go to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. It says you should submit yourselves to God, right? Uh -huh. And flee from, away from the devil and, let the, uh, and leave the devil alone. So you have to submit yourselves. When you submit yourself to God, what does what the description of that thing in, is, in Arabic? It means asleep. And that is a Muslim. You see, so submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. So any Christian watching me, to say you are a Muslim to God is not a foreign word. It's just an Arabic word to describe the same scenario which has been done since creation. You just need to submit to the will of God. That is what makes you a Muslim. Simple. Right? So you go to the book of Psalm chapter 66, verse 3 to verse 4. You see the concept of Muslim there. Chap Psalm chapter 81, verse 15. You see the concept of Muslim there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Concept of Muslim there. It goes on and on. You understand? It is the same word which has been described in another language so that you can benefit from it. That is it. You see? Good. Now, so God says in Quran chapter 21, verse 108, he's telling the messenger to say, it is only inspired to me that your God is one God. And this concept, you find it in the Bible. You find it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Even Jesus was telling the people, children of Israel, oh Israel, hear me, oh Israel, your Lord, the Lord our God is one Lord, is one. So the concept of oneness of God has been there since creation. Every devoted religion knows that but then when they start adding the man-made concepts the indoctrinations that is when they change the concepts by their scholars then it starts becoming you know sectarianism then we have the shias the sunnis you go to christians we have catholic we have methodist we have Pentecost, we have whatever 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 groups orthodox they keep creating you go to even the jews they have different sects among themselves because they have different types of beliefs you see now the second issue, <clears throat> the second issue is the mainstream Muslims who keep telling you there are five pillars of Islam. That is a lie. You take the whole Quran, there is no such thing as five pillars of Islam. Right? Aha. Uh -huh. Prophet Noah, he never went to Hajj. Prophet Noah, throughout the Quran, we don't see any concept of uh, what we call uh, uh, Siam. That he did. There's no concept of Siam for Prophet Noah. We never seen it in the Quran. That's Noah did Siam. <clears throat> we didn't see any concept of Noah establishing Salat. So is he going to hell? Just because we don't see any concept of him establishing Salat, we don't see any concept of him doing Siam, we don't see any concept of him doing Hajj. Is he going to hell? No, it is not pillar of Islam. What do you mean five pillars of Islam? Islam never started with Prophet Muhammad. So how did the five pillars originate from you now? It's from your own books. The Quran never says there are five pillars of Islam. 
So if you have that indoctrination in your head, please unlearn such, such stories and relearn Islam again. Islam has to, to be taught by God. Quran chapter 5 verse 3. Aliyawma akamautu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum nimati wa raditu lakum ala islam adina. He says, today I have completed my blessings for you, yeah, yeah, your religion for you, and I've completed my blessings upon you, and I have approved Islam, that is the submission, to submit to God as a religion, as a faith for you. So God has completed Islam, and it is in the Quran. Quran chapter 6, verse 115 says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ سِدِكًا وَعَدْلًا he said that the word of your Lord is complete in truth and justice. So if you have a book, chapter 6, verse 114, the verse I just quoted, the verse above it, he says, Afa gairi lahi abtagi hakaman, wa huwa lazi anzala ilaykum ul kitaba mufassala. He's asking you, will you seek other than God as a judge while he is the one who has revealed to you a book explained in detail? Are you dumb to say the Quran has been has not been explained just because we don't see two rakat, three rakat, the garbage scholars have given you? You think it's part of Islam? Is that how Islam works? Is Islam for your father or is it for God? So if it's for God, why that doesn't your father shut up for God to do the explanation? After he say in Quran chapter 24, verse 18, when you God is the one explaining the verses, clarifying the verses to you. And out of our foolishness, we accept these so-called scholars who keep saying they are students of Islam. <laughs> Pay attention. The so-called scholars you know today, if you go to them, they will still keep telling you, oh, we are students of Islam. We are not scholars yet. So who are the scholars? I don't know still. Who are the scholars of Islam? If you go to Zakir Naik right now, he will tell you, I'm only a student. You go to Mufti Menk, I'm only a student. You go to Numan Ali, I'm only a student. Hello, who are the scholars? Where are they? But every day when they are preaching to you, they keep telling the scholars have said, the fuqaha has said, the ulama have said. Who are these? Who are they? Where are they? Is it the blind followers you want to be? You don't want to question your scholars and they keep indoctrinating you with lies, 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 and you're accepting it? Can't you reason for once, ladies and gentlemen? We have to unlearn everything and start from afresh. Wallahi, like keep telling you, you have to unlearn everything from the whatever they tell you, the shahada. The shahada is full of shirk. I'm telling you for a fact. I have lectures on them. It's on my YouTube channel. The shahada you are doing today is full of shirk. Let me tell you the concept of shahada today. The five pillars of Islam they have given you, not God, the five pillars of Islam they have given you. They say you have to say Ashadu Allah ila illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Abdu wa Rasul. Right? So now he says you bear witness that there is no God but Allah. That I agree with. Even God does the same thing. Quran chapter 3, verse 18. You can bear witness. Somebody will say, Nah, why are you bear witness? Why are you there when God became now? You are not bearing witness that. You were there when there was God. No. You are bearing witness that there is no God, no other deity except Allah. That is allowed. Because before you came to the earth, the God who created you is telling you in Quran chapter 7, verse 172, that you bore witness, you testified before he brought you to the earth. You came in this, in this world. He made you testify. And you testify for yourselves. Somebody will say, how come I don't remember? When you were born as a toddler, one year old, two years old, do you remember whatever you did? Do you remember the pooping you did in your pants? Can you remember? Even though you are on this earth, can you remember that? The answer is no, you can't. So because God is a just God, he's not an unjust God. Quran chapter 10, verse 44 to 45. Because he is just to you, he is reminding you. Because to forget is part of the human nature. You understand? But God, God does not err nor forgets. So he reminds you what you have forgotten. Before you came to the earth, you bore witness that he is your Lord. So you know there is no other Lord before you came on earth. That's why he keeps telling you, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Every 
creation of the world knows that he is the only law and God. So you have the right to say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. You can bear with us, fine. But what, have, what about Ashadu Anna Muhammadan? We see that Quran chapter 63 verse 1. Whoever says Ashadu is the form of hypocrite in the Quran. Quran chapter 63 verse 1. Even when Muhammad was alive, the hypocrites, when they come, Nash'adu innaka la Rasulillah. We bear witness that you are the messenger of God. It's a lie. God says they are liars. How can you bear witness? Were you there when Muhammad became a messenger? They weren't there. They weren't there when God chose him as a messenger. No. No, 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 no. None of them were there. Quran chapter 4 verse 79. <clears throat> God says, Wa arsalnaka linnas rasulat wa kaffa billahi shahida. And we have sent you as to mankind as a messenger. And God is sufficient as a witness. So, God is telling you he is sufficient as a witness. And out of your mushrik ideology, you make the scholars tell you, if you say, Ashadu Allah, Ilah, Illallah, and you don't add Ashadu Anna Muhammadan, Abdu Wa Rasul, you are not a Muslim. Are you a fool to accept that doctrine? Can't you unlearn and relearn Islam from God? Were you paying attention when God says, Wa arsal naka linnas rasulan, wa kafa billahi shahida. And sufficient is God as a witness. Are you a fool to now superpass God and bear witness that God is telling you he is sufficient? Are you dumb? Are you nuts? Can't you unlearn and relearn? You let your scholars just lie to you and you accept it blindly? Hello? Why do we keep playing with our faith like that? Why do you let the scholars just make... First of all, the so-called scholars we, you and I are watching every day, who put them in front of you as scholars of Islam? Ask yourself the question. Was it the Prophet Muhammad who chose them for you? Which criteria? But you find out that they are the man-made... They are part of the man-made concept of Islam. And they have the Saudi Arabia regimes choosing them for you as top scholars. And they keep telling you the lies and the garbage is from their own scholar scholarship books. And you believe them. Islam has been to be taught by God himself in the book of God. That is how Islam works. Submission. You submit to God. You don't submit to Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or anybody. No. Submit to God. So this Shahada, I keep telling you, when you come and tell God, Ashadu Anna Muhammad, were you there when Muhammad became a messenger? Were you there? Did you bear witness? Were you there? Did you see it with your eyes? Do you understand the meaning of Shahada? To bear witness, to witness something. If you go to a courtroom, you should be arrested and sentenced to life in imprisonment because you weren't there when Muhammad became a messenger. So you are a hypocrite, as said in Quran chapter 63, verse 1. Yeah, you are. If you are doing it, refrain. Wallah, if you are doing it, stop it. If you don't stop your emotion. I'm serious. Because God says he is sufficient as a witness. So if you also claim you are a witness, you are, you are, you are going loggerheads with God. And that makes you a mushrik, an idol worshiper. Because you are taking your own ego as your God. Do you see how it works? Do you resonate with the logic I'm giving you? That is a critical thinking ability in the deen. And God allows that. Takilun, you use your reason. You see? So if they gave you five pillars of Islam, and then they will tell you, you have to do the shahada before you become a Muslim. What current nonsense? Did Abraham do shahada when he was looking for God? Quran chapter 6 verse 75. When you read downwards to 82, did Abraham do any shahada? Did he say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah before he became a Muslim? Hello? 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 <laughs> the same man, God is asking us to follow his creed. Quran chapter 3 verse 95. Sadaqallahu. Fattabi'u millata Ibrahima anifa. Follow the creed of Abraham. The man we are asked to follow his creed. The messenger who received the Quran is telling you and I, we should follow the creed of Abraham. This Abraham, did he say any shahada? You let these scholars lie to you? 
and they mentally enslave you and you think islam belongs to arabs no islam was there because before arab came came to the world if islam was there before prophet muhammad came to the universe islam was there with the children of israel before the arabs were given the quran <laughs> Quran chapter 2, verse 197. Even the Quran, eh, the children of Israel already had knowledge of the book before Muhammad was given it. It is not a new thing. It is just in Arabic language. Quran chapter 46, verse 12 will give you the hint. Lisanun Arabiyyun Mubin. It is there as a tazdik in another language. That is it. Don't think Islam started with the Arabs. Don't think Islam started with Prophet Muhammad. He came to meet it. Go and read Quran chapter 22, verse 78. Huh? Quran chapter 22, verse 78. Ibrahim. It is the creed of your father, your forefather, Abraham. Was Abraham an Arab? Hello? Prophet Muhammad himself in Quran chapter 6, verse 161. What did he say? Kul innani hadani rabbi ila siratin mustaqim. Deen and kiyama millata Ibrahim hanifa. Prophet Muhammad himself opened his mouth and said, his Lord has guided him to a straight path, the creed of Abraham. And you are foolishly walking on earth proudly, say, I'm proud to be a Sunni. I'm proud to be a Shia. I'm proud to be a Ahmadiyya. I'm proud to be a Tariqa Tutiyaniya, the dumbest fool ever. You are. Because you refuse to unlearn and relearn Islam. Somebody wrote a question. He says, that's Mohi Harakat says, so if there is no five salah in Quran, then how do we pray? You see, some of the questions we have to refrain from asking. The dumbest thing for you to always think is that Islam is all about prayer. <laughs> right? Ask yourself that question, that Abraham, if he was asking the same question you are asking, will he be a Muslim for you today to be a Muslim? right islam is not about prayer look even an atheist when the aeroplane is about to fall down he knows how to pray to god he will pray by force so islam is not about prayer put the prayer issue aside quran chapter 98 verse 5 the number one concept of your deen is to know god and sincerely devote your deen to him that is number one objective if you fail this objective your salat is useless your zakat is useless because your salat and your zakat what do they do in the hasanat using hibana say your hasanat your, the good deeds you are doing it is only to wipe out your bad deeds that is the purpose of your salat and your zakat because zakat is the form of purity you give money in order to purify yourself to the poor and the, to the needy and whatever have you. That is a cat. But when we take salat, this is the act of remembering God. Because Quran chapter 20 verse 14 says, Wa akimi salat li zikiri. You establish the salat for the zikr Allah. That is why God says in Quran chapter 2 verse 152, He says, Azkuruni wa ashkuruni wa la takfuruni. He says, remember me and I will remember you. That is the purpose of Salat, the act of remembering God. It's for the remembrance of God. But how will I remember God if I don't know God? If I've been taught is a God from the garbage books, if I've been taught about God with full lies, how can I know the God I'm remembering? It is only the book of God which will what? Explain who God is to you. If you want to know about me, you need a book of my biography where I have written for myself, not somebody has written. Me, me. I have to write my own biography for you to actually understand who I am. God, you want to know God? Take the book of God to understand who God is. Don't go and take garbage book. Some scholar somewhere in the desert thinks he knows better than you. Reason well. Good. You go to a workplace, you want to work, know the job before you serve the boss you don't know the job you are you'll be the dumbest worker ever because what are you in the workplace to do you don't know the work 
you don't know the boss what is about the work is about what the boss want us to do you are just there what is the point do you get what i'm what i mean here aha uh -huh. <clears throat> now let's move on uh i'm checking my time i'll be coming to the questions and answers let me skip the topic a bit so that i can uh, catch up with time uh salam sharif karim somebody says do you know methodology uh, that is the uh -huh, minhaja methodology is in the quran everything god has given you methodology in the quran it's not outside the quran chapter 5 verse 48 god has given every every uh, group their laws and their what they are what manhaj minhaja that is methodology so don't let any scholar tell you the methodology is found outside the quran you'll be the dumbest fool for instance abolition uh abolition the washing the gossip you go to Quran chapter 5, verse 6. God is telling you step by step how to do the gusm. This is called what we call minhaj. It is a methodology of doing something. The method in which you do a process to do something. So this methodology, if you take before salat, God says, Ya yu lazina amanu, iza kuntum ila salat, fagusulu wuju akum. You see, this is a methodology explaining to you what the process you have to do for something. So this methodology, if God wanted, he would have done the same thing for Salat. He would tell you, hey, look, if you want to do Salat, after you get up, look here, do this, say this, do that, do that. But he has left it to your own discretion in some of the things. You only have to look to the examples given to you in the Quran by the other prophets who, has, who have also established Salat. Then you do the same. But what you have to say has to be different because we all have our needs and desires which we have to tell God. You will never see one question in the Quran when they were asking the messenger a question. You will never see a question which says, yes, alunaka and it's salat. It doesn't exist in the Quran. Where God will say, when they ask you about the salat, kul, no. But we see the question of, yes, alunaka maza yunfiku. When they ask you what they should spend or disperse, give, tell them this. When they ask you, yes, when they ask you about the hour, cool, say this. When they ask you about the women, nisa'a, say this. When they ask you about the yatama, the orphan, say this. When they ask you about that, say that. All those questions you see in the Quran. You will never see a question when they say, God says, when they ask you about the salat, say this. It's an irrelevant topic. Quran chapter 24, verse 41. Even the beds, they know their salat and their tasbih. How much more you, the human being? The act of remembrance of God. What do you want God to tell you again? You don't know how to remember God? Just go and do your evolution and remember God. Do the examples are in the Quran. Copy that same thing and do your salat. That's it. What do you need? Scholars will tell you do two rakat, do three rakat. You have to do kabli and body. If you don't look left, you are not going to heaven. If you do you do a tayya and you don't do your hand, you're like this, the devil is next to you. What kind of iron garbage informations are they giving you? And you uphold them without verifying. Whatever is not in the book of God, put it in the, in the trash. Yeah. Whatever you don't find in the book of God, put it in the trash. And even the book of God, don't just believe it blindly. You have to scrutinize it, examine it, contemplate it. Quran chapter 4 verse 82 afala yatadabbaruna alquran walau kana min indi ghayri allah la wajidu fi ikhtilaf katira you did not contemplate the quran had it been from other than god they would have found in it numerous contradictions so yours is to contemplate even the book of god before actually partaking in it quran chapter 17 verse 36 says do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge so why just get up like a sheep following what you don't have knowledge just because some scholar somewhere thinks he looks like an Arab. So he's telling you something. You say, MashaAllah. Nothing baffles me like when I see people go into the Friday Salat Qutubah and then they see the scholar who stand there and quote Hadith garbage books and keep telling him, uh, uh, quoting some stuffs that you are sitting there, you have no idea what this Imam is telling you. And you're wasting your time. Instead of using those hours to sit down and study the book of God. Simple. Yeah, the king of truth. That is what Sunnis do. Yes. 
uh yeah yeah i have the salad video tutorial which actually gives you the idea and concept on how to do the salad and this video you see me do i pick every example from the quran nothing i did in the quran was outside the quran right however the concept of the sujood if somebody wants to bow down even without putting the heads down so far as he has bowed down without putting the hands at uh, the heads down it is not bad it's not uh, uh you know restricted no right so because sujood has different a lot of concepts when you go down even without the head touching the ground it's still considered sujood however what i'm doing is the literal understanding of the words being mentioned so when you are that taking that you can verify for yourself the verses i quoted whilst in the tutorial whilst doing those postures so keep in mind right uh mushfiku says how to convince non-muslim brother someone that 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 this quran is from god and is preserved as we don't follow history of uh you know mushfiku sheikh first of all god never said the quran should be preserved by human beings neither does he say human beings should preserve the book secondly in order to convince somebody that the book is coming from god quran chapter 4 verse 82 says Afala do they do not contemplate the quran then he says had it been from other than god they will have found in it numerous contradictions right or discrepancies so when you take the book for instance i'm sitting here right now and I find a book in front of me. Let's say this is a book. And I found a book here in front of me. And I pick it up. When I pick it up, and it's written, the book of God. Wow. Uh-huh. The book of God. I don't know. I don't need to know where it's coming from. What I need to do is, now I need to open the book. And start checking the book. And start scrutinizing the claims the book is making. Bear in mind. So a non-Muslim taking the Quran for a challenge in order to see this book, is, is it coming from God? He will need to acquire knowledge of the book. Quran chapter 10 verse 39. It says, The point is, People deny in what they have not encompassed its knowledge, while its interpretation has not even yet come to them. Likewise, did those before them did. The problem is, in order for me to reject something, I need to grasp the knowledge of it, to know the back and front, to draw a judgment on it. That is why when you watch programs like American Idol or football, for instance, Ballon d'Or, when they give the European best player, or you watch American Idol, they bring judges to sit down who know about music or who know about football to sit down and pass on their judgments or their commentary because they have the expertise in that field. So in order for you to draw a conclusion on something in the Quran, you have to acquire the knowledge of the book, number one. For people who are claiming Prophet Muhammad is not a messenger, when you go to Quran chapter 13, verse 43, it tells you that if you have the knowledge of the book, you will actually know that he's a messenger of God because he delivered the book. And the book is claiming to be from God. So yours is to scrutinize the book. But after you scrutinize the book, then you can choose now to believe in it or not to believe in it. Quran chapter 18, verse 29. It says the truth is from your Lord. So whoever wills, let him believe. And whoever wills, let him disbelieve. So same goes to the point that when you go, for instance, for instance, I'm organizing a charity uh, program, right? It is called Hop Nima. And I usually do it every six months, right? I've been, I started, I think, three years ago, right? And I've been doing it six months, six months, six months. Now, in order for me to, to convince you, I need to prove to you what I do when you donate. I have the, I think I have the link somewhere on my page, right? So when you donate, when I distribute the foods, which I'm starting by the by the end of this month, I'm starting that, right? So when I distribute the food, when we they go for the distribution back in Ghana and they give to the people, you see the t-shirts and everything, and then the food they give to the people, I need to bring you the evidence which will convince you. 
But even with the evidence, we have people who will still doubt, even though they've, they've scrutinized it and seen the evidence. We have people who might doubt and say, oh, I think he just went somewhere to just take some pictures and put it there. You understand? This is the human nature. So God has given you the chance. In order for you to put your faith in something, do not pursue what you have no knowledge about. So you have to scrutinize that thing, examine that thing before you can decide to either believe or disbelieve. So it's a choice. God is never forcing you. You understand? Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's let's move on. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for those on TikTok. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. The king of truth say chin on the chest is suju. Well, anyhow, you can describe it. So far as you are doing the sujud, God asks you to do. It's, it's sujud. Good. Now let's move on. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, 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 Mushfiq Sheikh. Inshallah. If you are willing to be guided, the only way to be guided by God, you have to listen to Quran chapter 16, verse 104. Those who do not believe in the verses of God, God will not guide them. You understand? You don't believe in the verses of God, there is no way he can guide you, right? So you have to, say, there are certain things, you don't put blind faith. You have to examine things God is telling you, right? I have put the, the book of God to the test. Certain things I see in the Quran, I don't just believe it as once. I scrutinize it and I examine it and I call on God. If this is true, convince me this way. Do this, this like I want to see this, I want to see that. Because we see prophets doing the same thing in the Quran, right? Abraham. When he had, when he, when he was doubting how God raised the dead, he asked God, in order to attain certainty, he told God, I want to see how you raise the dead. And God asked him to take the bed, slit into four parts, and call the bed, it will come. So there are certain things, you ask God for it, he will show you the signs, so that you understand and put your faith there. Yeah, let's move on. So the main concept of faith, to understand what can nullify your faith or make you faithful to God, is based in Quran chapter 4, verse 136. That is Surah to Nisa, right? Chapter 4, verse 136. And I quote the verse. Let me see if I can share the screen, right? Uh, let me see. Maybe I can share the screen. Quran chapter 4, verse 136. You can inbox me, uh, Mushfiq Sheikh. Try to inbox me. I don't want to be distracted from the lecture right now. So try inbox me. I have anything we can share, right? Inshallah. Quran chapter 4, verse 136. It says, Ya you ala rasulihi. anzala min kabul. فَمَنْ يَخْفُرُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَلِيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَقَدَّ اللَّهِ دُلَالًا بَئِيدًا Now what is God telling us in that verse? God says, all you who believe or who have believed, right? Believe in God and his messenger. And the book which he revealed to his messenger. And the book which he revealed before. Then he says, when whoever disbelieves in God, number one, and disbelieves in the angels, number two, <coughs> and disbelieve in his books, number three, and disbelieve in his messengers, number four, and believes in the last day, that is the judgment day, number five, then he has, has, he has strayed far astray. The Lord and uh, 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 the and far astray. Now, this tells you the moment I believe in God, it is the, the number one pillar of faith. I can't have faith in God if I disbelieve in God. This is what we call pillar. So, the pillar of faith, number one, is to believe in God, number two. To believe in angels because they are the ones God is sending as messengers around you. Quran chapter 22, verse 75. 
God chooses angels among the people and the angels. He puts it, sorry, he chooses messengers among the people and the angels. So the angels are the ones who God sent to bring message to the messengers on earth, the people. And then the people will now become messengers to us around us. Do you see? So if you believe in God, who is now going to send the angels? And you believe this, uh, sorry, if you disbelieve in God, number one, and you disbelieve in the angels, who are now bringing the books to the messengers? So automatically, you disbelieve in God, you disbelieve in the angels, you disbelieve in his books, you, believe in, you disbelieve in the messengers as well. And then you disbelieve in the day of judgment. Because if you don't believe in God, how can you say you believe in the day of judgment? So these five things, this is what I call, I didn't say God called them. This is what I call the pillar of faith, Islam. Because if you disbelieve in God, your faith is useless. You disbelieve in his angels, your faith is useless. You disbelieve in what? His what? Books. Your faith is useless. You disbelieve in his messengers. Your faith is useless. You disbelieve that there is a judgment deed. Your faith is useless. That is the pillar of Islam. Do you see how it works? And that's why God says you are far astray when you disbelieve in such things. That is what holds your faith. And that doesn't necessarily mean you are this, you are believing in God blindly. Quran chapter 47 verse 19, God is asking you to know that there is no God but him. You have to know. It's not only about believing that there is no God but Allah. No. It's about knowing. Somebody will say, how do you know? You have a soul, right? Have you ever seen your soul? How come you believe you have a soul? Because there are signs around you which tells you you have a soul. Have you ever been to the mortuary? Do they have souls? Every critical thinker knows they don't have souls. They are dead. The soul is gone. You have a soul, right? Have you ever seen the soul? The answer is no. How do you know you have a soul? You know even without seeing it. So just because I know there is no God but Allah doesn't necessarily mean I have to see God before I believe in God. Use your critical thinking ability that God has given you. We know there's electricity, right? I'm using electricity because my laptop is working. My phone is working. The light bulb is working. Have you ever seen electricity with your eyes? Can you describe it? How does electricity look like? Have you ever seen it with your eyes? How? Can you describe electricity? How does it? How? Have you seen it with your eyes before? But you know it exists, right? And you believe it exists. So two things. God told us angels can come in the form of human beings. We see it in the story of Abraham. We see it in the story of Lot. We see it in the story of Maryam. They come in human forms. And they come to change things in your life. I have witnessed such concepts before. I'm not saying I saw angels with a with, with wing. I've seen angels with the form of human beings. Who come to change certain things in my life. You have seen them also, but you will not remember. However, I give you a hint. Sometime in life, you just come across somebody. You don't know the person. But they decide to do something good to you. You will never phantom why this person is trying to help you or do something, favor you with something. They will just favor you and go their way. You will never, ever see them again until you die. Those people are sent by God. To come and change one or two things in your life. That's why you hear people say, you are my angel. Or you see hear people say, you are God's sent. These are angels around you. So when you go to Quran chapter 41, uh, verse, I think it's verse 30, where he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهِمُ لَمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَعَزَلُوا the angels, they are the, your awliya, they are there, they are, they are your allies. Fil hayat dunya and the akhira. So angels are not your allies only in akhira. They are your allies on earth as well. They come in human forms. They came to Maryam. They came to Abraham. They came to Lot. 
and you think you are inferior you think angels cannot come in human form to you but the point is when they come to you they don't have to tell you we are angels you run away you understand when they come to you for instance let's say a ghost <laughs> for instance <laughs> let's say uh, okay let me use a gene a gene comes to you in a human form or some, another form right something you you are not going to be scared they came to you in human forms yes genes do come in human forms make your research you find that out when a gene comes to you in a human form and then let's say you are talking to him all right you are having a discussion you are smiling you are everything because he didn't tell you he's a gene you don't have the fear here but the moment he tells you dude i'm a gene Maybe you run faster than Usain Bolt. By the time you realize you are somewhere far away. <laughs> I'm giving you this example because Moses did the same thing. When he went to the fire, next to the fire and God called him. And blessed is who, who is around the fire and the one who is around it. Right? Now, guess what? When Moses dropped his stick and it became a moving snake. He was running faster than Usain Bolt. And God called him back. Come back. <laughs> no run. It is the nature of a human being. The moment he discovered, how come he's been holding the stick for a long time? He never ran away from the stick. But the moment the stick became something, he's running away. And same goes with every human around us. Check the story of Abraham. The angels never told Abraham, we are angels. They only said, we are messengers. Because they have a message for you. They never told Lot, we are angels. They only said we are messengers. When the spirit came to what? Mariam, he never said I'm an angel. No. It is God telling us from his perspective that he sent a spirit to Mariam. And he appeared to her in the form of a human being. Because you the human. When a spirit who has taken a form of a human should open his mouth and tell you I am a spirit. Oh boy. I dare you, you run faster than you same boat. You never stand there. Do you see how the logic works? Aha. Uh -huh. Sorry. The human being is not afraid of what he cannot perceive. So let's say I'm sitting here and there's a snake behind me. And I don't know. I will never be afraid. I will be sitting and enjoying my drink. But let me have the sense that there's a snake behind me. Every two minutes I'll be checking behind me. Do you see how it works? Hey, salam, Maria. Salam, I will say uh, Salis, now Sister Natalia says, Salam, I have a question, brother. Is there a difference between heavens and paradise? Because Quran talks about seven layers, but science also describes seven layers in the sky. Are the angels in those layers? Yes, there's a difference between heavens and paradise, right? The heavens are the Samawat, the layers. The earth also have layers. Uh, if, if I can remember the verse, let me see if I can quote that verse for you. Uh, for instance, the word layers for the heaven, the heavens, you see Quran chapter 71, verse 15. It mentioned layers, tibaka, layers. Uh, sorry, Quran chapter 67, verse 3. It mentioned God created the seven heavens in layers. So the heavens are in layers. And same goes with the earth as well. We have layers of the earth. Quran chapter 65 verse 12. God is the one who has created seven heavens and the like of them of the earth. Yes, Quran chapter 65. Yes, this is uh, the Surah Tul Talaq. Surah Tul Talaq chapter 65 verse 12. Yes, so the heavens and the earth are all created in seven layers. That is the layers. Right? Aha. Uh -huh. So he says, Allah will lazi khalaka sabaa samawati. Sabaa samawati. So they are created in seven. And the seven has been explained in other chapters, in layers. Then he says, Wamin al art. Mithla hunna. You see, mithla hunna. So the like of them, the seven heavens, the earth also have seven layers. It goes by layers. Tibaka. In Arabic, we say tibaka. That is layers. So it's correct. Right? Uh huh. Uh, Sharif Karim says, uh, Brother Shrive, is there a difference between the day of resurrection and the day of judgment? 
the day, the day of Deen, Yawmul Deen, and then Yawmul Kiyama. When we say Kiyama, it is the day they will raise us from the graves. Resurrection. After you are raised, then we go to the, the what? Judgment. Yawmul Deen. Now, this is how it works. In the Quran, when we say Yawm, it doesn't always mean day. Yawm can mean period. <laughs> You understand? It can even mean, in some instances, it can mean time. So the word yawm doesn't always mean day. In the Quran, if it's, if I say al yawm, it can it, I can say the day, or I can say today, or I can say this day. The word al yawm, right? And then the word al yawm, the yawm again can mean period. So a period defines time, right? Aha. Uh -huh. So when we say Yomul Kiyama, Yomul Din, Yomul Fasan, uh, Yomul, uh, it goes on and on. Those things define a period of time. It doesn't necessarily always mean 24 hours a day. No. Right? Uh -huh. So there are different understandings to it, but they can describe the same event from different angles, which, which means that same day, a lot of things will be happening. You understand? I give an example. Let's say today is 11th October 2022. Let's say today is my birthday. For example, let's say today is my birthday. Hey, yeah, Avram Bimoshi, hi. Let's say today is my birthday. Today being my birthday, maybe there's a special event in the same day happening. But because it is in the period, we are having a period of an uh, event happening in the same timeline, whilst my birthday is also happening in the same timeline. So when God says Yom Din, it describes a period of an event happening in the same period of the timeline. Remember, whilst the resurrection will happen, there are other events which will be happening on that same timeline when the judgment day is happening. You understand so that's the difference understanding but we don't say it's a different day somewhere then this one will happen on a different day somewhere no no that's not understand the Quran gave us Amy Walter says salam please what is wrong with saying Allah Akbar in Salat uh, sister sister Amy Walter I have a video which is, which breaks that down however to simplify that when we say Allah Akbar you are saying God is the greatest right you put it in the superlative form now the moment you say god is the greatest there's a comparison it's, it's look in a logical sense the moment i'm talking about football players i can now use a superlative form to describe their standard so if i say lionel messi is the best there's a comparison if i say lionel messi is the greatest there's a comparison if I say Cristiano Ronaldo is the greatest, there is a comparison, number one. First of all, God in the Quran is saying there is no deity but Allah, but him, right? There is no deity. He is not claiming there is other deity. However, the pinpointing of other deity are just the false gods people have created from their impression. So now, if he is saying there is no deity but him, he is trying to tell you the other deities are false. But, for example, Cristiano Ronaldo cannot say there are no other players but him. There are football players which are evident, which can be proven evidently that they are players, official football players. So, in that instance, when you make a comparison and you say Allahu Akbar, I want to ask you, you are saying God, Allah is the greatest, right? Allah will Akbar is the greatest of which gods? Who are you comparing God to? Who? In that instance. Somebody will say, oh, in the Quran, he says, Ikra wa rabbuka la akram. You are talking about Rabb. In the Quran, it is not only Allah who is called Rabb. Go to Surah to Yusuf, chapter 12. More, uh, Joseph used the word Rabb to describe the king of, this, of the prisoner who was released to go and serve the king, the wine. You can start from maybe verse 30 downwards. He used the word rub, right? And in an Arabic world, even we go to court in English world, 
you go to court, the judge or the, the yeah, the judge, they call him my lord. My lord here denotes someone who is a master over you, right? So the lord, in the concept of lord, we all know lord is not only attributed to God. But however, God classifies that in the Quran to say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. The praise be to the Lord of the universe. You, you see the concept, how God uses it. However, confirming to the deityness of God, Allah, he is the only Allah. So he never allowed you anywhere in the Quran to call him Allahu Akbar. He gave you Quran chapter 7 verse 180. And he gave you, he says you should call him by his best names. He gave you the names to call him. For instance, Quran chapter 59, verse 22 to verse 24, you see the examples of the names he gave you to call him. So now, if he is giving you a name to call him, and you come and stand in the Salat, and you are calling him Allah or Akbar, just ask yourself the second thought. Did he give you the permission to come and call him a name he has never approved? Is that how he says you should call him? My name is Baba Shwai, right? If you come and call me Kojo Kumsi, does it make sense? That's your answer. <clears throat> yeah, Allah wa Kabir is tolerated because God himself calls himself Kabir. And then Quran chapter 17 verse 111. He says, wa kabiruhu takbira. Wa kabiruhu takbira. So he says you should use the takbir. If I say takbir, if I say takbir, not ak takbir. If, you say, if I say takbir, wa kabiruhu takbir, if you say Allahu kabir, is enough. That qualifies it. According to the grammar, if you say Allahu Akbar, you are going against chapter 17, verse 111. He says wa kabiruhu takbira. He didn't say ak takbir. He didn't say you should like put the magnification in a, in, in a uh, type of superlate, uh, superlation form. No. Uh -huh. So understand that concept. Anyways, let me move on to bring the topic because it's getting dark here. I have to go soon. And then they will bring you the concept of hadith and sunnah. Many a times you, uh, you see the scholars telling you, you have to follow hadith and sunnah. Prophet Muhammad never said that. No, in no book will you ever find Prophet Muhammad say you have to follow hadith and sunnah. And if they claim Prophet Muhammad, you have to follow his sunnah, they ask them this simple question. Bring me one book from your hadith when Prophet Muhammad prophesied and told you that Imam Bukhari or Imam Muslim will be coming after me. Out of your foolishness, you are able to tell us that Prophet Muhammad is telling you that Jal will be coming. To even go to the extent and tell you Jesus is coming, which the Quran doesn't say he's coming. He's dead and gone. He's never coming back. But you are saying from your hadith books, Jesus is coming back. The Jal is coming. All this you attributed to your fake prophet in the hadith. If that is the case, your fake prophet was unable to prophesy Imam Bukhari coming to bring his books. He, he was unable to prophesy that Jami at Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Sunan Ibn Nisa were all coming to bring books for you to follow for guidance. After God telling the, the prophet of the Quran, Quran chapter 2, verse 272. He told him clearly, Laisa alayke hudahum, Allah yadi man yasha. Their guidance is not based on you. However, God guides whomever he wills. So you are now out of your foolishness coming to tell us these are the Sahih books, Sahih Bukhari books that will guide you in Islam. Are you nuts? And when we ask you a question, you tell us this is the hadith of the Prophet. If you don't follow this, you'll be misled in Islam. Are you, are you, what is wrong with your, your logic? Somebody being alive, God had told him their guidance is not based on him. Is it now that he is dead? You will bring garbage books and claim those garbage books will guide me in Islam? Will you then not reason? Quran chapter 17 verse 9. Listen what God says. Inna haza la Quran la ya He says, indeed, this Quran guides to that which is more appropriate. So if the Quran guides to that which is more appropriate, why would I waste my time following garbage books of dead people? Are you going to compare ancient knowledge with the modern day knowledge? 
Do they have smartphones at that time? I have smartphone now. Are you going to compare old smartphone, uh, old phones with the modern day phone in terms of technology? Do you see how knowledge has evolved? So you want me to go and follow some desert man's ideology who sat down to write garbage books for you? I'm following the Quran because it's claiming to be from God. And I've scrutinized it and I see what I can resonate with it. Quran chapter 39 verse 55. God didn't ask you to follow everything you see in the Quran. You will be a fool to think everything you see in the Quran has to be followed. Quran chapter 39 verse 55 is telling you to follow the best of what your Lord has revealed to you. You take something in the book, it doesn't make sense, put it aside. Follow what makes sense to you. Believing is a choice. I can choose to believe in something. I can choose to disbelieve in something. However, when I take stories in the Quran, I believe. But it doesn't mean I should follow it. Quran chapter 2 verse 208 is clearly telling you that you have to enter into Islam. Do not follow the footsteps of the devil. Now, how will I know the footsteps of the devil? It's found in the Quran. We see how he was arrogant to God. We see the arrogance the devil did. We see how he misled people. We see the example of Pharaoh in the Quran. Does that mean I should go and follow the example of Pharaoh? Does that mean I should be arrogant as the devil was arrogant? Where do I find those stories? In the Quran. But does that mean I should follow it? The answer is no. God is not asking you to follow everything from the Quran. You'll be a fool to think everything you see in the Quran has to be followed. However, you can believe. Believing is a choice. I give an example. Right now, I'm talking to you. Then I said, my father owns the, the airport of Ghana, the Kotoka International Airport. If I tell you my father owns it, yours is just to believe or disbelieve. If you believe, it changes nothing in your life. If you disbelieve, it changes nothing in your life. Tell me, what benefit are you going to get? If I just come to you and say, oh, you know what? Hey, Jesus spoke when he was a child. That's it, I'm telling you. Jesus spoke when he was a child. Say, oh, I believe. Yeah. Tell me, what is the impact in your life? What does he do? What, what will he do? So when I tell you Jesus spoke when he was a child, and you say, I believe, that means you are going to heaven just like that. No. <laughs> it's about following the instructions God wants you to follow. That is what defines what you are a Muslim. You submit to God. So Quran chapter 2 verse 8 says, Among the people, women and nurse, man yakulu amanna billahi wa biliyawm al wa ma hum bimu'minin. Among the people are those who say we believe in God in the last day. But God says they are not believers. Believing is not about saying it. It's about action of what God asked you to, the commands he told you to do. That is what defines Islam. And it's not mainly about saying I believe in something. Oh, I believe Moses used a stick to part the sea. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I believe. Do you believe? No. Why would I hate you? That is not Islam. That is not what defines Islam. Those stories are just there to make you see that the same things which are impossible can be possible with God. That's why we say, Laku water illa billah, chapter 18. There is no power except with God. So the concept is just to give you the idea that things can be possible with God. That's it. But it's not there that just because somebody says, oh, I don't believe Jesus was born miraculously. Then I say, oh, you are going to hell. Ahi, you are going to hell. You don't believe Jesus was born miraculously. Are you nuts? Believing is not about saying it. It's about an action. Quran chapter 2 verse 225. God will not hold you responsible for the nonsense you are speaking from your mouth. He holds you responsible for what is in your heart. That is what defines you, the human being. That's why it says, Illa man ata Allah bi kalbi salim. Your heart defines everything. But what you are saying with your mouth, that is garbage. You understand? So your faith is determined by the instructions God has given you that you have to follow. So God says in Quran chapter 39 verse 55, follow the best of what he has revealed to you. Quran chapter 39 verse 18. Allazina Those who listen to the word and follow the best of it. 
ulaika allazina adahumullah wa ulaika hum ulul alba those are the ones whom god has guided and they are those who possess what intelligence you follow the best of what you hear and follow the best of what god has revealed simple but believe in don't force people to believe what you are saying quran chapter 10 verse 99 god was asking the prophet are you going to force the people to believe will you force somebody to believe your concept you believe in the prophet marry ccs old girl are you going to force me to believe that i say i don't believe you call me <laughs> a cafe just because i refuse your garbage books come and open the quran and show me where it says prophet marry ccs okay is it a big deal come i'll give you thousand euro come call your scholars that Baba tribe says come and prove to me where god says he should marry ccs or gold or god endorses the garbage narrations they are giving you that he marries his years. So come, let's see. <laughs> Nara Power says, I like your haircut. Thank you very much. My my brother Baba Sidu, he did it for me nicely. Yeah. And and also Salis. Sometimes they both do it for me sometimes. But he did it. He made me nice, right? Like I knew I need I look handsome, handsome. That's what my son told him. Salim says I look handsome. So thank you. Abdulaziz Elechi, yeah, welcome. So guys, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, Sharif Karim, Quran chapter 43, verse 43, and you continue to verse 44. That is what God has given us to follow. We have to follow what God instructs us. Huh? They will tell you the hadith and the sunnah. Even though they know, no hadith they have can be compared to the Quran. Right? Quran chapter 52, verse 34. They should bring out a hadith like it if they are truthful. They are not truthful. Now, you see, huh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you an example. Somebody is asking me a question. Look, look at the question. Look how it sounds. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the best of creation? Do you see? He used the word, do you believe? Ahi, no, I don't believe. You see, by answering such a person, no in his head because he has been mentally enslaved you see this guy is a kafir he's whoa oh, are you going to hell you don't believe give me one verse in the quran where god says prophet muhammad is the best of creation you see their eyes about to pop out <laughs> because he doesn't exist as <laughs> allow Guys, don't let people fool you. Wallahi lazim. Uh, don't let people fool you. Quran chapter 38, verse 45 to verse 49. The best prophet God chose, and he says, uh, Akhyar. When we say Akhyar, is the superlative form of a plural for something which is good god chose them as the best the best six prophets god chose as the best the name of prophet muhammad is not found there he mentioned abraham ishmael isaac aliasa uh, zilukifil the the name the name of muhammad is not part of the ahaya when he mentioned the best with god i'm only bringing this instance to poke the mushriks they will keep telling you certain concepts which are not found in the Quran, yet they want to force you to believe. When you say you don't believe that, then they, they hate you. Right? So you want to ask me questions, ask me questions which we can prove from the Quran, then we can deliberate on that. You see? Good. Now, going forward, they will use their Hadith books trying to put, impose on you, even the Sunnah, the concept of Sunnah. Quran chapter 33 Verse 38. I, I take you to that chapter to explain to you how Sunnah is described in the Quran. Quran chapter 33, verse 38. There is nothing the Prophet is doing which is outside the Quran. Everything he has to do has to be in the Quran. So if you claim he married a CCSO girl, ladies and gentlemen, simple and yet yeah, bring the verse in the Quran. Let's see where he married CCSO girl. That is a big deal for you. You are struggling. Come, let me give you 1,000 euro for that. You're running away. Quran chapter 33, verse 8. He says, Ma kena, huh? He says, Ma kena ala nabiyyi min haraj fi ma farad allahu lahu. Sunnat allahi fi lazi khalahu min qabl. 
wa kana amrullahi qadaran maqdura this is the sunnah here there is no guilt upon the prophet concerning what god has ordained for him if god ordains something we have to see it in the quran quran chapter 28 verse 85 ah inna allazi farada alayka alquran la la raduka ila ma the one who has obligated the quran on you uh, imposed the quran on you will bring you to a place of return so the quran was an obligation so whatever the prophet has to do has to be based on the quran that is the obligation so god says ma kana ala nabi min haraj fi ma farada allah lahu there is no guilt upon the prophet concerning what god has ordained for him and which is the quran then god now says sunnat allah fi allazi khalahu min qabl that is the sunnah of god throughout those who passed before the all the prophets they were giving instructions to follow that is what we call sunnat allah it's not the sunnah of muhammad neither does he say sunnat the prophet muhammad are you nuts come and open the book and show me the sunnat an nabi you have to unlearn these garbages and relearn islam can can touch this 50 says the fact that he chooses him last and give you and give you the quran does that say something to you no it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't when you choose somebody last and give him something does that make him the best what do you mean who taught you by mistake <laughs> ah sectarians don't even know how to use logic <laughs> Oh my god. Uh let me see. And again, these people will tell you any time the prophet name is mentioned, you have to say sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is wrong. Anybody doing that, you have to refrain. That is idol worship. Because you don't even understand the word sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You don't understand what does it mean? Do you understand it? They will tell you you are sending blessings of the on the prophet. You've been lied to. In Arabic the word baraka. Baraka. Baraknahu bless them we bless them it has nothing to do with salah sallallahu alaihi wasallam doesn't mean sending blessings you be a fool to think that word is about blessings wallahi lazi it's not about blessings however if you claim you are sending blessings to the dead prophet who is dead if you are sending blessings let me ask you this you and the prophet who deserve to send blessings upon the other you out of your foolishness the mushriks you are telling us he's the best of creation and you are again telling us listen you are the, again telling us he's the one to intercede for people on the day of judgment and out of your foolishness this person who god has already approved according to your understanding that he is going to heaven right you are sending blessings to him for god to do what for him now tell me honestly you are again sending blessings to somebody you claim is the best of the creation And again you claim on the day of judgment he is the one going to intercede for everybody. Now you are claiming you are sending blessings upon this person to do what for him. You you the one sending bless are you blessed? Because in order to bless somebody I need to be blessed. In order to give somebody money I need to be rich. In order to be give somebody knowledge I need to be knowledgeable. Out of your foolishness your scholars are giving you doctrines that you don't reason to question them. Why am I doing something like this? You don't do that. Oh, he doesn't believe that. He is a kafir. This guy is going to hell. This will allow him. What? You send him blessings upon the prophet? You and him who deserve to send blessings upon the other? <laughs> you. You send him blessings upon the prophet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's simplify this. They said, "Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad." Listen carefully. According to them, he says, "God send blessings upon the prophet and the, the the family of the prophet." God, you are telling God, should send blessings. Okay, let's make it simple. They will quote chapter thirty-three, verse fifty-fifty-six. This is what they do. 
inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna 'ala an-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu 'alayhi wa sallimu taslima they will translate it as what sending blessings you are nuts to think sallallahu means send blessings you are nuts because if that verse let's assume that verse is saying blessings listen carefully i'm going to show you a contradiction your scholars never give you the chance to think about let's assume that verse is saying god is sending blessings listen carefully god says indeed i and my angels are sending blessings upon the prophet just for argument's sake let's let's agree that they are saying blessings right so god says he and his angels are already sending blessings to the prophet now listen to this stupidity here then now god says so all you who believe send blessings upon the prophet does it make sense hello does it make sense he god and his angels are sending blessings so you should also send bless how do you send the blessings then they come in and say allahumma salli ala muhammad are you nuts god already told you he and his angels are sending blessings according to your understand this is what you guys say so now why are you telling god again allahumma salli ala muhammad you are now telling him what he told you indeed i and my angels are already doing for the prophet you again came and told god again god send blessings upon the prophet is that the blessings you are now sending or you just don't understand the arabic language of the quran I don't understand this. For those who don't understand the meaning of the word sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have it. I explain in one of my YouTube channels. If you go to the topic of the, the, the Salat series, find the playlist, the Salat series, I've explained it down. There is a tasrif there. There's a conjugation. The word sallallahu sall, uh, alayhi, it doesn't mean send blessings. And it doesn't mean Salat. It's a different thing altogether. In Arabic of the Quran, one word can have multiple meanings, especially if it's conjugated. It has multiple meanings, different meanings. It doesn't mean salat. It doesn't mean blessings. Neither does it say pray for the prophet. You'll be a fool to think you are praying for the prophet. Wallah, you are a mushrik to pray for the prophet. Somebody who God has already approved. Somebody you and I already know he has been, he's been satisfied, certified that he is, he is successful. You are now going to pray for a dead man. Why don't you use that energy to pray for your dead parents? If you think God will save your parents, use your blessing to bless your parents, the dead ones. Okay. Now, again, they will bring the concept such as, uh, they will say Muhammad was sent to teach the Muslims. That is a lie. God never sent Muhammad to teach the whole world. You will never find one single verse where God says, God sent Muhammad to teach the whole world. No. Quran chapter 6 verse 19. The Quran was inspired to him in order to warn us by it and whomever it may reach. So yes, he has to use the Quran to warn us. And we can see the warning of the messenger in the Quran. Quran chapter 15 verse 45. فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَإِيدِ and he has to use the Quran to remind whoever fears the threat of God. You understand? So the Quran he has to use to remind us. Yes, we see that. Then Quran chapter 27 verse 92. Wa an atlu Quran. He has been inspired to what? Recite the Quran to the people. So yes, he recites the Quran. But you will never see a verse where God says he has to teach everyone. However, Quran chapter 62 verse 2. Basa fil minuhum wal so it is the only ummiyina whom he has to teach. The unlearned ones. The ones who never received a book from God. The ones who have no idea what the book of God is about. Only those people he has to teach. He is not sent to teach us. No. We now 
the knowledge of today, we are knowledgeable than those people he has to go and teach. You don't know? The people he has to go and teach, you ask the mushriks, what does the word ummi or ummiyuna means? Out of their foolishness, they will tell you it means illiterate. So if they are illiterate, is it me? <laughs> you are going to compare with those people he has to teach? Huh? If you call the people that the messenger have to teach them illiterate, I don't believe they are illiterate. Unlearned means they never receive any book from God, which they have studied. They don't know about any book from God. Because even among the children of Israel, we have what we call Ummiyuna. Quran chapter 2, verse uh, 78. Ummiyuna, la ya'la Those who don't, know, who don't know the book, we call them Ummiyin or Ummiyuna. Those are the ones the messenger was sent to teach among his people. But he was not sent to teach the whole world. No, because the children of Israel already have knowledge. Quran chapter, they already know the book. They have scholars. If you are knowledgeable, you don't need someone else to come and teach you. You are knowledgeable. It's like I know how to write. You are coming to teach me again how to write. What? Listen carefully. Don't misquote me. He wasn't sent to teach the whole world. He was only sent to teach the Umiyuna, the people with him, who don't know the book. He taught them the book so that they can now know the book of God. If I know the book of God, I don't need any garbage hadith to come and say they are going to teach me the Quran. You are, you are a fool to think that the garbage hadith books will teach me the Quran. Yes. After God claiming Ar-Rahman, God is the teacher of the Quran, not your garbage hadith books. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are the criteria. Number one, Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of Islam, neither is he the one who starts Islam. Number two, there are no such thing in the Quran called what? The five pillars of Islam. It doesn't exist. Number three, hadith and sunnah have no room in the Quran. The only best hadith you have is the Quran. Quran chapter 39 verse 23. Allahu nazzal al-ahsan al-hadith. The best hadith is found in the Quran. Quran chapter 45 verse 6. God is asking you, Tilika ayatu Allahi natuluha alayka bilhaq fa bi ayy hadith ibad Allahi wa ayati yuminu. So in which hadith after God and his verses will they believe? And when we say sunnah, the sunnah is found in the book of God, which is the sunnah Allah. There is no sunnah al Nabi. There is no sunnah of Muhammad there. So don't fool yourselves. It doesn't exist. So anybody who tell you you have to follow hadith and sunnah is a mushrik. So leave them and their mushrik ideologies. That is the Sunni, the Shia, the Tijaniya. Leave them alone. Then again, Muhammad as a messenger was only a teacher for the Ummiyina. He wasn't a teacher for mankind in general. If you say he's the teacher for the whole of mankind, bring us a verse. It's as simple as ABC. Simple. <clears throat> so let me go through some of the questions. Uh, Salam Zad Tun says what? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can put... I can maybe pick up one, one, one caller before I end. My phone number is there. You can call me via WhatsApp number. Uh, then I can like answer those questions. If the prophet can live his life based on the Quran, why can't we do the same? Do we need external book? The answer is no. Holoko Quran, this is what the Hadith book is saying. They say the character of the prophet is the Quran. So if that is the case, he follow the Quran alone, we can follow the same number. Yeah, well, excellent, brother. How are you? I'm fine. Yes. How is everything? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. No. Okay. So my question is that I just want to decipher. I think that you know me. I'm one of your honesty lower. So your decide about the said blessing and um, prophet Muhammad. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. So, you know, there is a that says, I'm a full alhamdulillah, was salam on Alan Ibadi, the Dina Stoffer. So, I just want to ask you, uh, does Mohammed do, uh, do not belong to the uh, Stoffer? Those, those that, uh, hello. I can hear you. You finish your question. I want you to finish. Yeah. Yes, yes, because uh, I think that I do uh, a perfect moment down to the uh, all the, the group of the that uh, I can't no, I don't know how to explain it because the most of the most the verse the verse is found in Quran chapter uh, 27 verse 59. Quran chapter 27 verse 15. It says, Alhamdulillah. Wasalamun ala ibadihi lazina astafa. Then he says, Allah wa khayrun amma yushirkun. That is the verse. Yes. Quran chapter 27, verse 9 has nothing to do with sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The word sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not there. The word, what God wants you to do for the, for the, when an honorable chosen uh, person by God is mentioned. Listen, for instance, if Isa yeah. is mentioned, Prophet Isa, I can say alayhi salam. Yeah. If Abraham is mentioned, I can say alayhi salam. Any chosen servant of God, I can say alayhi salam. It's just a sign of respect. Alayhi salam. Yeah. It, it doesn't say you should say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Do you understand? I don't know. I, I so I the notion of alayhi salam is different from saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sallallahu is a, is a mushrik act. It's a sectarian act. It's not commanded by God because they've been misunderstood. Okay. Quran chapter 33 verse 43. God does the same concept for us. Then he says, min zulumati ila nur. So God is the one who reaches out to us. It's an act of reaching out to help somebody. It's like a, to help you. So when I reach out to you, I'm in order to help you, to communicate with you. So God is reaching out to us in order to bring us out of the darknesses into the light. Quran chapter 40, 14, verse 1. He sent his book so that he can bring you out of the darkness into the light by communicating to you in his book. So when you follow the guidance of God, you come out of darkness. That is how we do the salli Allah upon you. So when he says salli Allah upon the prophet, the act of reaching out to the prophet, because he cannot be on his own alone. He need believers, people around him to support him, to help him, to reach out to him also. Imagine in your life you are alone, you are lonely in your room. Nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody wants to support you. Nobody wants to reach out to you. Would you commit suicide? Sure. So that is the point. It is not about sending blessings. What, do you, what does the prophet need your blessings for? Everything you are doing has a reason. So you should be able to know the reason and God will tell you the reason. So why will God tell you send blessings? What's the reason? Where did he explain in the Quran that you have to send blessings so that he does what to the prophet? Sure. I hope you get the point. Yeah, okay. My question is number two is that. Hello, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you. Let, be, let this be the last question because my time is almost up. Yes? I know. You know that I usually ask you questions if you can view all my conversation. Yeah, yeah, so I know. So I was facing, yes, I was facing challenges, I mean, between my, me and my parents because I was in lockdown that there is no five solar in, only in the one. So I usually pray two times and sometimes in the middle of the night. So, but they usually talk to me that, that, um, you know, that I'm delayed from either sort of mistaken. So, they usually frustrate me. So, I actually, I don't even know what I can do. I used, I used to do it silently right now because I don't want disagreement between two, uh, both of those. So, please, I don't know, maybe you can enlighten me on it. So you know, sir, you said that Allah tell you how you open, what Allah will call and Yeah, yeah. Uh, let so, yeah, let, 
let me help you on that. You know, when you go to Suratul Luqman, uh, it gives us the hint on how to uh, address such issue. Uh, concerning your parents, God mentioned your parents, and He says, "Wa in jahadaka ala antushrika bi ma laysa laka bi ilm, fala tuti huma." He says, "Fala tuti huma." You understand? But He says, "Wa sahibu huma fi dunya ma'arufa." So your yes, parents, yes, yes. you have to respect them. But when it comes to the notion of the faith with God, they want you to associate partners with God. In that instance alone, God says don't obey them. But it doesn't mean you have to raise your voice on them. You have to use logic to beat them, just like Abraham used logic to beat his father. Always use logic to beat them. Don't be the one explaining yourself. Be the one to question them. Ask them questions. Just tell them, my parents, you've been practicing this deen for over 50 years. If you can sit me down and prove to me from the book of God, I will surrender to your, to your, your opinion. Put them to that test. And tell them, you will only surrender to them in the sense of God if they can sit you down, open the Quran, and prove it to you. Tell them, don't. they shouldn't say, we, let's take you to a sheikh. No, 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 no. Tell them, why would they practice something they cannot prove? Do you get my point? Yes, yes, I get it. Uh -huh. But you have to do it in a respectful way. Not like you are going to banter with them or try to override them in speech. You do it in a respectful way. Then you make them understand with logic. You understand? So God, that's why God says, Waswahibhuma fi dunya ma'arufa. You have to escort them in the world with kindness. So you have to use a kind gesture when dealing with your parents. It's just a simple task. Just say, okay, parents, if you can prove to me the five salat you are doing or this thing you are doing, just prove to me with knowledge from the book of God. I will, I will surrender. I bet you. I will bet you. Unless they are born again, they, they die and come back on earth again before they can teach you. They, they cannot prove to you. So they will leave you in peace. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but you can back so, channel me later. I'll be asking my question. You know that you say the time is going out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can. No problem. Let's leave. Later. Let's leave it now. Send me an inbox, or maybe my next topic. Write it down, or send me an inbox. Mm -hmm. I'll save it. Then my next topic, I'll answer. Okay. Inshallah. My time is really, really up. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, I wish I have more time to be doing the program, but I don't. I'm I'm a busy person, a family with my kids. But you know, so this is the best time I can find to interact with people. And to enlighten people right i'm not claiming i know it all but however i'm dealing with the book of god whatever i see there is what i deal with if you give me something which i don't see there that becomes your opinion so stick to what you know that's your opinion you can't force me to believe you i can't force you to believe me so let's understand this concept that's all i stand for so subhana rabbi is and at the same token I find a problem with someone manufacturing lies and fabrications and dramatizations and mythologies with Jesus Christ, especially when Jesus Christ himself had nothing to do with the evidence that they use. Now let's keep it on point because that's the issue. There's no tug of war here. There's no issue here of arguing, trying to uh, cast aspersion upon Jesus or Christianity because Jesus for us was a Muslim because Muslim means one that submits to God because Abraham was a Muslim because he submitted to God and Moses was a Muslim and David and Solomon were Muslims and all the prophets of God were Muslims because Muslims doesn't mean Arabs. It means those that submit themselves to the law, the legislation, the inspiration, and the revelation from Almighty God. So if Jesus is a Muslim, we on his side.